Brothers and sisters, thank you. John is entirely objective. <laughs> Being my cousin has nothing to do with it. Now, John, I'm going to say something about John in a moment, but I, I am incredibly humbled by a truly overly kind introduction. But I'm energized and honored to be here with you because this is a union that means business. This is a union that gets it done. This is a union that organizes. This is a union that changes the status quo. And you should be very proud of that fact. Now, before, before I went to college, I grew up in the Boston area. And so it's always special to be back. Because of this union and a lot of other good people, you have a governor here in this state, in Deval Patrick, who actually remembers and thinks about working people every single day. And that's something you should be proud of. And you have extraordinary leaders at Local 26. I've gotten to know them. I am personally so appreciative for their friendship, but they are the real deal when it comes to leading a union. I want to thank Brian Lang and, of course, your former president, Janice Lux. Let's give them a huge round of applause. And I want to talk about your international leadership, past and present, but I want to say that I'm really moved that you chose a theme for this convention. You know, a lot of people get together and they have a convention. And it's a good time, and people pat each other on the back and rest on their laurels. And then there's Unite Here. And I'm looking at it right there, changing 50,000 lives. That is not just a slogan to everyone in this room. That's not a small goal. You could have said, let's change 1,000 lives. We can get that done. No, you said we want to actually do something that changes things for good. We're going to change 50,000 lives. We're going to organize people. We're going to push ourselves to do more each year. And by the way, people who push themselves to do more each year actually achieve more each year and have victory in the end. And that's why you will change 50,000 lives. I always say to people when they talk to me about the things we do, they talk to me about the work we're doing, pre-K or paid sick leave or affordable housing, and sometimes people say, well, is that going to make a difference if you do this many or that many people? And I say, wait a minute. Think about the individual. Think about the individual family. Every time a family gets economic security, it changes their lives forever. Every time someone gets decent wages and benefits, for them and their children, life will be better for decades to come. Every time people, has a safe, people have a safe, safe workplace, you know they'll come home safe every night and be there for their family. This is not a small endeavor. These are not small ways of affecting people's lives. These are foundational ways of affecting people's lives. You're not just touching 50,000 lives. You could have said that could be your slogan, touching 50,000 lives. We'll meet them. We'll give them a bouquet of flowers and move on. No. You're changing 50,000 lives for good. So now, on the question of the international leadership, I want to first talk about the man who has passed the baton with such clarity and grace, because that's who he is. I, yes, he is my cousin. And he, if you, I, I was very moved by what he said about me, but I could say about him many times over. In the, some of you may remember the 60s and 70s when I was growing up. We had a phrase back then. It was, what you see is what you get. So that is John Wilhelm in a nutshell. And by the way, when he started out, 
And Vincent Cerebella, as he said, was such an extraordinary influence on him, but John just started right into the fray. There wasn't any warm-up, there wasn't any period of wandering about, wondering what to do for the world. He just started right into organizing. And the interesting thing is, some people start in a noble cause, and after five years or ten years, you know, they feel they've done enough or they get tired. John never got tired. John never stopped. John never changed his focus. We feel in our family the same thing about him as a member of our family. If you even hint at the notion that someone needs help somewhere, John will go there unannounced and just help a family member. And I think everyone in this union knows that feeling in the work you've done with John. So you've been blessed to have had a leader over those years who came here to do such good with such integrity, but always remembered exactly who he worked for. And that was his passion, the people he served, and uplifting them and strengthening them and organizing them. And everyone in this room has benefited from it. Let's thank John Wilhelm for all he has done. Now, over the years, I got to know Dee Taylor. And you know, you get a first impression of someone. And with Dee, I got a strong first impression, and then just like John, that first impression never wavered. Dee came across from the very beginning strong, focused, tough, a fighter, organizer. The more I talked to him, I noticed a little bit of edge to Dee Taylor, just a little edge. Very good edge. He could be like a character in an HBO show. Got a little bit of edge there. And I liked it. And I said, this is, this is what it's going to take in this day and age when so many powerful forces are arrayed against working men and women, when so many people are trying to take us back. You need leaders with some edge. So I kind of analyzed it over time, and I came to a very sharp, clear conclusion about the proper way to describe Dee Taylor. Dee Taylor is a badass. And you could not be more fortunate, you could not be more fortunate to have a leader like that in a time like this. Now, I just have to say just a few more shout outs and then I want to say a few things about the, the times we're living in and what we should do about it, but I'm going to keep it quick. First of all, I am a New Yorker. I want to thank everyone in this union from New York for everything you do to make our city better. I want to thank two individuals whose leadership is extraordinary. I'll tell you, when I went to Bill Granfield and I said we were going to organize to achieve pre-K for every child in New York City, he saw it as his mission, too, for his members, but also for everyone else in the city. He went all the way to Albany. He organized members to go to Albany. When I went to Peter Ward, I talked about the need to get after school for children in our family. Peter Ward gave one of the most eloquent testimonies I've ever heard about the power of after school because he talked about his own life and what it did for him. And just in these last days in New York State, we resolved, a lot of us resolved in labor and progressive organizations, elected officials, that somehow we were no longer going to accept the madness of the state of New York, one of the bluest states in the country, having a Republican-led state Senate. And Peter stepped up in a very big way to make this change. And we're going to have a Democratic State Senate in New York State this fall. Now, the traditions of this union, the history of this union, so powerful, so consistent. In New York, we have a special understanding 
of achieving social change. We have a special understanding of the labor movement because it's been so core to who we are and so much of what is good about New York comes from labor. In this union, the unite piece of the unite here combination, that goes back to the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, the amalgamated clothing workers who are foundational to the labor struggle in New York City. And this was, this was year after year, leaders and activists and organizers coming forward and saying, there's something else out there. We have to reach it. We have to find it. New York City, New York State, 100 years ago, I guarantee you, the assumption wasn't we would have so many people unionized and we would have the values we had. People had to create it. They had to go where people had never been before. Those unions did it, other unions did it, Al Smith did it, Franklin Roosevelt did it, Francis Perkins, Fiorella LaGuardia. It took unions, it took activists, it took leaders to imagine something different. Because as John said, that conventional wisdom, it'll get you every time. You know, you turn on the TV, you pick up the papers, you go online, the conventional wisdom, it chokes us all. Because it always tells us what we can't do rather than what we can do actually tries to convince us of an illogic, that we shouldn't work for our own economic interests. That's the message, isn't it? That working people shouldn't work for their own economic interests. We've been told that in one form or another for decades in this country, especially since Ronald Reagan came along. You can hiss at that. I'm, I'm amazed I had to cue the hissing. So, Ronald Reagan comes along in 1980. Let me take you back 20 years earlier to this very town. Let me tell you something. This may be a little radical for some of you. I hope I, hope I won't offend you. Let me give you a quote. Let me give you a quote. A political leader said this in 1960. He said, our labor unions are not narrow, self-seeking groups. Their goals are goals for all America. And their enemies are the enemies of all progress. I hope that's not too radical for you. <laughs> 1960, I guess you want to say, what labor organizer was that? What activist was that? The gentleman named John Fitzgerald Kennedy said that in 1960. He said, the enemies of the unions are the enemies of all progress. So what happened from 1960 to now is incessantly we have been told not to remember that fact, not to believe it, not to say it out loud, not to be proud of it, when in fact it was right all along. You represent progress. You represent an inclusive society. You represent economic and social justice as clear as day. You, this union, has shown this country what organizing looks like time and time again and how to win organizing struggles. You have shown that issues that were supposed to be taboo, like immigration reform, were actually mainstream and necessary and fair. This union did so much to put immigration reform front and center for this country. I wish our Congress were as good as you, because we would have it already if our Congress were as good as you. So we in New York, we said something simple. We said, we're actually going to live by the notion you heard President Kennedy talk about. We're going to be proud to work with labor. We're going to be proud to support labor. I think a mayor a governor, I think any elected official should be supporting organizing efforts by labor, because it's in the interest of this country. <laughs> think about it. Think about it. And, and when people contest this and when they challenge you, think about this for a moment. What do you do? You help take a person or family that doesn't have enough in the way of wages and benefits, doesn't have enough security, doesn't have promotional opportunities and a path forward. You bring them all those things, you strengthen that family, 
You actually bring people the American dream that's been slipping away for so many. You bring it to them. You deliver it to them. And when you do that, it's not only the right thing to do from a moral perspective or because of what we believe in in terms of the labor movement, you also have now said to the taxpayers, to the governments, that family's okay. That family's okay. They're not going to fall down and you're going to have to pick them up. That family is now on the right path because labor put them there. What could be more patriotic than that? So in New York, we said we're going to do it differently. We're going to support organizing efforts. We're going to stand by car wash workers and airport security workers and fast food workers. We're just going to stand there and do everything we can and use the power of the mayorality and the bully pulpit and everything we got to say to employers, you've got to treat people decently. And with our public sector union brothers and sisters, we're going to do something shocking. We've been doing it in New York for six months now. We're going to treat them like part of the solution, not part of the problem. You know, it's been a sport, in a sense, a sport in this country since the Reagan years to go after labor. There's been a particular passion amongst Republicans and conservatives for going after teachers. Something I never figured out, people who educate our children, why they look like such a delicious target to these people. I would think people who educate our children would be perceived as good people. So that's how we've treated teachers. And we worked with our teachers, and we came up with one of the best contracts in generations that creates lots of reform in our schools of the right kind, of a progressive kind, that helps us engage parents more deeply. It's going to help us treat working people decently and find ways together to save money for the taxpayers. The minute you treat people with some decency and dignity and as partners, it's amazing what you can do. If you treat them like pariahs, you're not going to get anywhere. And so we said, we're going to treat private sector labor differently, become allies and partners in organizing. We're going to treat public sector labor differently, become partners in running the city, making things work better for everyone. And then we said, let's go head on at income inequality. Let's go head on at a host of inequities in our society. And of course, here it comes again, conventional wisdom said, that's just lovely, you actually can't achieve it. So I imagine many of you, when someone challenges you, tells you something can't be done, you just work that much harder. So I, I really should send a thank you note to those who challenged me for bringing out my best motivation and helping me along. So we. <laughs> We have passed legislation in our state capital that will give us the funding for full day pre-kindergarten for every child in New York City. Yes. And any middle school child who needs a safe, secure place to go after school where they can keep learning and get tutoring and support, that is guaranteed them for free now. We passed a paid sick leave law that covered a half million more New Yorkers at the stroke of a pen and gave them rights they deserve. And we're building 200,000 units of affordable housing in the next decade. That's enough for half a million people to live in. So. Let me finish with this. What I outlined to you, that all happened in six months. So conventional wisdom, I don't think I'll get an apology note from the conventional wisdom people, I really don't. But we were able to do that in six months. Why? Because we kept organizing. Because we kept organizing. We have watched the lessons of others. 
what succeeded, what didn't. And I think the lesson's pretty clear. When you're on the offensive, things happen. When you aim high, things happen. When you organize, things happen. When you hesitate, he or she who hesitates is lost, brothers and sisters. This is not a union that's very good at hesitation, which I like about you very much. So keep doing what you're doing. So don't hesitate. Remember that what you are doing, what you are calling for, what you are striving for is, in fact, the mainstream position. The media won't acknowledge it, but you represent the will and the needs of the majority. We live in a time where that consciousness has been slipped, you know, stripped away from us, taken away from us, but we know in our hearts it's our time. The fight against inequality is the issue of our times. The people want us to wage this fight. We're so used to leaders who won't say those words out loud, but once upon a time was normal. I told you what President Kennedy said. Let me say one other thing. I think this is a, such a beautiful and simple quote from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He said, quote, if I went to work in a factory, the first thing I'd do would be to join a union. Doesn't that make sense? People knew it, and they said it out loud for decades and decades, and then they stopped saying it out loud. It's time to say it out loud again. It's time to be proud of it again. And when you look to your elected leaders, demand of them that they don't kind of stand up for you or sometimes stand up for you or sort of stand up for you. Demand that they actually stand up for you. Demand that they tackle inequality head on. Demand that they support organizing efforts. Because you're not really helping if you're afraid to support organizing. And you have every right to demand that. I end with a profound thank you. You've made this country better. Your spirit is animating so much of the labor movement. It's encouraging and inspiring so many of us. You're there for us who are trying to make change. You're showing new ways of doing things. In this room are the seeds of a new and more progressive America. In this room, you will make the difference. And for that, I say thank you from the bottom of my heart, and God bless you all, brothers and sisters. <laughs>